Hey guys, welcome back to the Dr. Cliff AUD vlog. This is vlog number 105, and today is a good one for you because today I'm going to be talking about the proposed guidelines for over-the-counter hearing aids and specifically talking about the comments that were submitted by a couple of the key companies that would be impacted by the over-the-counter hearing aid proposed guidelines uh, as we go forward. Now, for those of you who are not aware, Approximately 90 days ago, the FDA released their proposed guidelines for over-the-counter hearing aids, and then we just concluded a 90-day comment period that ended on January 18th of 2022. So anyone could basically submit their questions, comments, concerns to the FDA about the proposed guidelines. Um, and so two of the companies that uh, have the most to gain and the most to lose, other than the consumer, of course, course from these guidelines is Bose and Starkey. So I went ahead and read through uh, the submitted comments from both of these companies and I just want to kind of go through what their key points were. But before I do that, if you could do me a huge favor, click that like button, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with the notification bell turned on as well if you wanna make sure that you continue to get my videos every single week. Um, but with that said, let's start with Bose. So Bose submitted a 16 page submission, submitted a submission, there you go. Uh, there were six key comments on it and I'll run through those key comments here really quick and then expand on them here in a second. Uh, so the first one was support of the gain and output limits. The second one is support over the FDA's approach to preemption. If you are unaware of what preemption means, it's basically saying that whatever these federal guidelines are, they would supersede any local or state guidelines uh, that your home state might have. Uh, the third one is suggestions for on-packaging labeling requirements. The fourth one is request for further clarification of the distinction between OTC hearing aids and self-fitting OTC hearing aids. The next one is suggestions for modifying the proposed approach to the quality systems requirements. And the sixth comment is support for use of the ANSI slash CTA standard with minor modifications. So let's go ahead and get into the gain and output and I kind of touched base on it already, which is um, I'm not surprised here that Bose was in full support of not having any gain limitations. So being able to apply any amount of amplification to an incoming signal into an over-the-counter hearing aid. And then I'm not surprised Surprised with them being in full support of having an output limit of 115 decibels or all the way up to 120 decibels if there is a volume control essentially on a particular hearing aid. Um, they basically cite that there is no safety concerns and that limitations to the amount of gain and output on an OTC hearing device uh, would stifle innovation and innovation is really what we're looking for here of course. Now, Bulls also does give it support for preemption. So preemption, like I said before, is meaning that these federal guidelines would supersede the state laws. Clearly, Bose and other over-the-counter hearing aid companies do not want to have potential limitations imposed on them by local governments. It would kind of defeat, really, the large purpose of having these federal guidelines allowing over-the-counter hearing aids, because if they didn't preempt local and state laws, essentially states could say, you know what, it's illegal to sell OTC hearing aids in this particular state, even though on a federal level it is allowed. So, um, you know, uh, Bose argues that uh, this would uh, make distribution in different states more complex and expensive as well. So if you had one state that had certain requirements and another state that had other requirements related to the allowed dispensing of OTC hearing aids, because they might have different guidelines in each state, the, the OTC hearing aid manufacturer would have difficulty trying to make sure that all the devices that they're dispensing are meeting every single one of these state requirements. So that's why they're in full support of preemption. Uh, the next one is suggestion for unpackaging labeling requirements. So uh, first and foremost, they want to replace the description of manufacturer's return policy with a statement encouraging the consumer to seek information about the seller's return policy that would presumably be available on the seller's website. And the reason that they're proposing this is because the manufacturer's return policy will not always be applicable because the manufacturer will not always be well, the manufacturer 
manufacturer will not always be the one who's selling the device to the end user. Um, take for instance, if you end up purchasing an OTC hearing aid, let's say the Bose over-the-counter hearing aid at a Walgreens, um, Walgreens will probably have their own requirement in terms of what the return policy is. Um, and so it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for there to be a manufacturer return policy since you're not technically returning it back to the manufacturer, you're returning it back to the seller. So um, I think they're just making a case here that it should probably be more along the lines of the seller because if the manufacturer is directly selling it to the end user, that also makes the manufacturer the seller of that particular product. So and to me, I feel like this makes sense. Um, it is uh, interesting to note though, this was something I pulled out as well, that Bose is indicating here the intent to use third-party sellers for their over-the-counter hearing aid products, which is ultimately good for individuals like myself who would potentially be able to um, have an account with Bose so I could resell their products as a distributor, um, which I think would be smart for Bose considering uh, my influence in the online space. Um, that being said, the second point that they're making here is that they want to streamline the content on all packaging labeling to improve clarity and brevity. So, you know, the concern here is that if you make so many requirements for the labeling on the packaging, you're going to have to have a huge package. It's all just a bunch of fine print that's really hard uh, to read and understand. So um, one example is to not require the labeling of the return policy on the outside of a package, citing that this policy may change from time to time and different sellers may institute different return policies. So Again, I think that makes sense. If, if the manufacturer puts on a return policy on the box, but there is a longer return period if you buy it at like a Walgreens or something like that, um, essentially it makes no sense. So I can see what they're saying there. And instead they recommend that, that if they put, you know, on the packaging, see return policy inside or looked up the return policy online or something like that, uh, they could have it indicated elsewhere. Um, another example is to limit the amount of information about the risks associated with over-the-counter hearing aids on the exterior packaging and have it on other user instructional brochure, brochure inside of the packaging, which I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. Like if you're someone who's considering buying this and then you buy it, you get home, you read the, the label or the, the user manual and it says that, oh, by the way, um, given what you're experiencing, this product is probably not right for you or you might have a medical condition. You already just bought the product, so it's just a big hassle of having to go in and return that. Not to mention, I think people are probably, I don't know this for sure, but I think pr people are probably more likely to read the outside labels than they are opening up and flipping through to the fine print at the back of a user manual. So uh, it is what it is. So I don't necessarily say that I agree um, with all of these limitations on the packaging requirements. I think that there should be a significant amount of um, you know, considerations and potentially warnings on the packaging of these particular products. Um, the next thing that we need to talk about here is the requesting clarification between OTC hearing aids and self fitting OTC hearing aids. So um, Bose really wants to know what constitutes a self-fitting OTC hearing aid. So, you know, there are, you know, parameters that are subject to customization. So if it has frequency dependent controls, does that make it self-fitting? Uh, uh, if it has a just overall increase or decrease volume, does that make it a self-fitting OTC hearing aid? Um, the degree of customization. So like, can you have those frequency bands, but just you only can have two and then it's not considered a self-fitting device? Uh, if it has preset programs that you don't necessarily customize, but you can switch into because those settings are perceived as being better for you, is that self-fitting uh, hearing aid? Like, uh, and then they also have the methods of customization. So if you end up going through a hearing test and then you hit you know, auto program inside of the smartphone app, does that can constitute a self-fitting hearing aid? So they just want clarification on all of this. And then, um, and then clarification on the need for a 510K pre-market notification. Uh, and so this would apply to self-fitting OTC devices, but not an OTC device that is not self-fitting. So um, that's essentially uh, another layer of regulation, regulation built in by the FDA to get 510K clearance, so to speak. And um, so you really need to know if your hearing aid is a, considered a self-fitting hearing aid or if it's not, because if it's not, then you don't have to go through all of this, you know, um, uh, the requirements to get 510K, right? So um, there's that as well. Um, quality system requirements. So uh, 
uh, Bose believes that the quality system requirement should apply to all hearing aids to ensure safety and effectiveness. And I agree, like a hearing aid needs to be able to meet the criteria of uh, being essentially a uh, functional device that does not have too much distortion, that has certain gain, or sorry, not certain gain, but certain output limits or, and things like that. So you have to be able to test that. Now, since Bose, so it's interesting because Bose is actually saying here that they believe that there should be these quality uh, system requirements in place for all hearing aids aids and I believe that they are along these lines because I think Bose knows that they can meet these requirements and it wouldn't be hard for them. But it would be hard for a lot of the other over-the-counter hearing aid companies that spring up that don't have the research and development of their products in place. And um, it would be tougher for them to meet these requirements. So Bose wants to make sure that there are requirements there because I think that that will limit their competition inside of OTC. They also specified, and I think this is smart too, that the 32 decibels of self-generated noise limit of an OTC hearing aid should be an A-weighted 32 dB. So it should be 32 dBA. And uh, just to make sure that all OTC manufacturers are essentially upholding the same, uh, or using the same scale when measuring the amount of noise, uh, because you can have different weighted dB scales. You can have dBA, dBC, there are other scales as well. Um, so you wanna make sure that you are all using the exact same scale to measure this. Uh, the next one here is to broaden, so the other reason for uh, quality system requirements is a request to broaden the allowable, uh, sorry, request to broaden the allowance of couplers that can be used for testing device to include acoustic mannequins like Keymar. Um, so I'll put a, a image of Keymar here on the screen for you so you can understand what a Keymar is, but uh, typically these uh, diagnostic type tests of a hearing aid are done with a 2cc coupler inside of a test box. So they just want to expand that and not limit the testing to be only done inside of a 2cc coupler, which again, I think makes some pretty good sense. Now that's it for Bose. I mean, nothing really surprising there from Bose. Maybe the maybe the support of um, you know uh, of having these quality requirements of a device. But again, that does make sense when it comes to Bose. Um, but you know, I think that uh, the things that they want clarification on, the things that they uh, want implemented, or the the things that they think should stay from the original proposed guidelines, uh, I think a lot of that makes sense. So now let's switch over to Starkey, who had a 23-page submission. So what was Bose, a 16-page? Uh, Starkey is a 23-page submission. And they have seven comments as opposed to six by Bose. And so the first one here is that uh, they want... Uh, to distinguish what distinguish what a self-fitting OTC hearing aid is and tailor the 510k requirements uh, to risk associated to the consumer. Um, and so just like Bose, they just want clarification on o what a, a self-fitting OTC hearing aid is. Number two, they want to establish a gain limit of 25 decibels for OTC hearing aids and overall limit of 110 decibels. The third one is they want to require validated labeling to ensure potential users can self-diagnose hearing loss. The fourth one is to retain restricted device status for prescription and OTC hearing aids. Number five is to retain quality system controls. Number six is to clarify narrow scope of preemption that remains, or sorry, that retains state and local protections. And number seven is to establish a federal level of consumer protection, including mandatory return periods, warranties, robust oversight of false and misleading advertising, and clear advice about the availability of help from hearing care professionals if you do not have success with OTC hearing aids. So let's jump right into the first one. So this one is to distinguish what a self-fitting hearing aid is, much like Bose, like I said before, is that we need to know exactly what constitutes an OTC and self-fitting OTC hearing aid. Um, boys, uh, boys, boys. Bose already pointed out the necessity of this clarity because of this gray zone that has existed since 2017, which resulted in many direct-to-consumer companies marketing their devices as OTC hearing aids, despite the FDA saying that they were not supposed to. Um, however, there was no definition of an OTC hearing aid at the time. So, you know, the essentially the FDA had no leg to stand on. So what they really need to do is they need to clarify exactly what a self-fitting OTC hearing aid is and what an OTC hearing aid is. Uh, Starkey has issue with the lack of necessity of unproven OTC devices hitting the market without a 510 requirement. 
uh, and I tend to agree on this. You know, um, uh, Bose or it's not Bose. Starkey is saying that you know you should at least require a 510k for the first OTC hearing aid. So not self-fitting, but the first OTC hearing aid from a manufacturer because you got to remember there's going to be some really shady manufacturers popping up trying to capitalize on this OTC hearing aid market. Um, and the, I think there has to be some kind of identification that this company has the capabilities of producing a decent product, and then after that you would assume that at least they have the capability so you would trust them to some degree thereafter um, to, to continue creating products that at least meet that minimum requirement. And then, of course, Starkey is citing the history of illicit OTC online hearing aid sellers. So um, there are already unscrupulous online hearing aid sellers that do not meet these requirements that, the way that they were initially proposed. And I would bet you that they're just going to keep doing what they're doing uh, because there is no requirement for them to, uh, to um, have this 510K uh, clearance, basically. Um, so the next one is to establish gain limits of 25 dB with an overall output of 110 dB. So for mild to moderate hearing loss levels, to be quite honest with you, 25 decibels of gain with 110 output limit is probably enough for almost every mild to moderate hearing loss that is out there. And, and exceeding that, um, potentially, according to Starkey, could uh, cause some damage to hearing for individuals. Um, you know, I. I do think that some consumers will be able to self-limit the amount of amplification that they get. If something's too loud, they're going to turn the volume down. If some things are too soft, they're going to turn the volume up. Um, but some will not. Some will not have that wherewithal to know that um, the amount of sound that I'm getting right now from this device is damaging to my hearing and I need to turn the volume down. I know it seems crazy to you, but trust me, there are some people who do not have the capacity to understand that a certain amount of sound that they're getting is actually damaging their hearing, right? Like we all do it all the time. When, uh, we all, a lot of us do it all the time when we go to concerts and we're like, oh yeah, it's loud in here, but you don't realize that it's totally destroying your hearing when you're in there, right? So you have to be aware of these kinds of things and the risks that this potentially poses to some consumers. Um, you know, and, and here's the thing. If these OTC hearing aids are truly designed for individuals with mild to moderate hearing loss, those individuals should not be wanting to get 50, 60 dB a gain out of their, their hearing aids, right? I mean, um, if they need that much additional amplification, they need to go see an audiologist because they have a much worse hearing loss than a mild to moderate level of loss. Um, now I'll share my my opinions on this, you know, here a little bit later in the video. Uh, but the next point here is that uh, the proposed improvement to validate the labeling for self-diagnosis of hearing loss. So this is one of the big concerns because individuals with hearing loss are notoriously bad at identifying what level of severity their hearing loss is. They, you know, you have some people who have profound levels of hearing loss and they swear they don't have a hearing loss, and then you have some people who have a mild level of hearing loss who feel like they can't hear anything. So like it's totally all over the board. With that. So according to Starkey, uh, they believe that the packaging should have validated statements for consumers to effectively and more accurately self-identify their level of hearing loss. So there are ways that you could help an individual with hearing loss be able to more accurately self-identify if they are in the mild to moderate hearing loss category. Um, you should not just leave it up to self-interpretation with no kind of guidelines for that. Now, um, if I can remember back to the initial proposed guidelines, there were a few statements there that like if you have difficulty hearing the TV or you know something like that but I think there needs to be something that's a little bit more validated that they that they can use and I think there is more validated stuff that's out there that through questionnaires and answering questionnaires you can determine with a, a, a high probability if this individual has just a mild to moderate level of hearing loss if they have potential conductive hearing loss or if they have something more severe right so I think that Starkey is on to something here there, there needs to be something to give a consumer an understanding if these products would actually work for them. Um, okay, so the next point here is that the proposed rule weakens the FDA's oversight for all hearing aids. Uh, the first point here is that uh, the concern is that maintaining device controls for OTC hearing aids is especially important in the current marketplace where manufacturers of consumer technology are increasingly adding health-related functions to their products. So you know you can buy a watch and it gives you like heart rate monitor uh, and blood pressure or whatever, things like that. Um, they, they just feel like as we progress into the future that the FDA has to kind of maintain some control over where everything is headed and not just like make it a free-for-all when it comes down to the medical side of, of healthcare, right? 
And so by making hearing aids widely available and easy to purchase, the proposed rule creates an attractive market for consumer technology manufacturers whose, whose businesses are aligned with an OTC delivery model. So the risk of not regulating unproven manufacturers in the OTC market uh, puts consumers at risk. For instance, uh, not requiring a 510k approval from an unproven device manufacturer, uh, no age verification requirement. So there is a limitation that individuals under the age of 18 cannot purchase OTC hearing aids, but you could be a 10 year old who walks into a store to purchase an OTC hearing aid and they would not have to like card you or anything like that. They could technically sell it to you. So there's essentially no teeth in that limitation, right? Uh, the third one point being here, for instance, is that relying on potential users to self-diagnose mild to moderate hearing loss with no validated labeling statements to do so. I already explained that in detail. Uh, and then eliminating restricted device status. So this is one of the big concerns that, that Starkey has. And it's because this undermines the legal foundation for conditions of sale. It weakens the FDA's enforcement authority of these guidelines. And it cedes the FDA's authority or gives up the FDA's authority over false and misleading advertisements. Not that the FDA really did anything about that before, if you ask me, like they just kind of let whatever the heck go. Um, the only time I've ever seen a company come down on was by an attorney general in the state of Arizona that told a uh, direct-to-consumer hearing aid uh, company here in Arizona that uh, they could no longer market in the way that they're marketing and that company complied. So um, kudos to the attorneys general. And by the way, the National Association of Attorneys General, they also are seeking clarification on this preemption thing because their whole role is to protect the consumers inside of their state. And if they lose that ability um, because of these these uh, federal guidelines uh, that's a problem in their eyes and it's a perfect example of the attorney general in the state of Arizona coming down on a hearing aid manufacturer that was essentially lying to consumers to sell their products so um, yeah I think we need to have some kind of clarity on that as well Okay, so the last point being here is that eliminating restricted device status paves the way for widespread non-compliance of OTC rules, right? So that's, that's one of their, for instances here, of why you do not want to give up restricted device status uh, for the FDA. Um, because if there's something I can tell you for sure is that there already are unscrupulous manufacturers out there or companies out there who are selling devices as OTC devices, even though OTC devices technically right now do not exist. Um, that is just gonna become much more widespread uh, as, it, as OTC gains credibility. There's gonna be companies who just wanna capitalize on that financially. All right, and so they say that the FDA should retain restricted device status for all hearing aids, not just OTC, but all hearing aids, which provides clear authority of the FDA to regulate. Otherwise, we are going to see voluntary compliance, not mandatory compliance to these guidelines. And that's really important, right? Um, because essentially, the good guys are the only ones who comply and all the bad guys are like, who cares? I'm just gonna do whatever the heck I want anyway, because there's no really clear um, authority here that's gonna come down on me. All right, so next point here is OTC hearing aids uh, should remain subject to the quality system regulation. So the concern here that Starkey is posing is that without the FDA fully asserting device regulatory controls, uh, proposing instead a framework that relies heavily on consumer behavior and assumption of voluntary compliance by regulated entities. Um, so that's the concern that they have. And then, you know, in contrast, the FDA's decision to make OTC hearing aids subject to QSR indicates that they recognize the health risks and benefits of this new technology and appropriately applies device controls to ensure the technology is uh, the technology's safety and effectiveness. Uh, so basically Starkey is encouraging the FDA to keep the QSR because the FDA has opened the door for modifying or presumably weakening these quality requirements. So, um, you know, a lot of these comments that are submitted, if they know that the FDA is kind of like, ah, it's a toss up whether or not we actually want to enforce quality of these devices or through what guidelines we want to enforce quality. Starkey is saying, no, you need to do it. Like you need to have some quality uh, controls here. So this is where Bose and Starkey are in complete alignment from what I can tell. 
Uh, next point here is clarifying preemption, and I've talked about this already. So the concern here is that the proposed rule does not adequately address the role of state and local protections for consumers. Uh, so as long as hearing aids have existed, the FDA has allowed state and local requirements to coexist with the FDA labeling and dispensing requirements. And currently all 50 states do impose professional licensing requirements to dispense hearing aids. Uh, I am one of those licensed individuals in the state of Arizona, uh, and I could not dispense hearing aids unless I had my dispensing license in Arizona. So now this proposed rule would, rule would repeal virtually all the exemptions from preemption issued by the FDA since 1980, even though those exemptions uh, relate exclusively to non-OTC hearing aids. And so um, I might add that maybe I won't even need to have, an license, uh, have a license in the state of Arizona to practice audiology anymore. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, and then, so the proposed improvement here is just to clarify preemption to retain state and local protections. They have a couple recommendations that the FDA can, can do to where it doesn't restrict the sale and distribution of hearing aids, but it still keeps a consumer protected. So I'm fully on board with that. Um, I just want clarification on it. Like I wanna know, like, can I sell OTC devices or is an OTC device for me technically by state considered a hearing aid uh, to where I need to be licensed to sell this hearing aid and then you know I can only sell it in the state of Arizona? Could I sell it online? Like I need to know these things um, so I know when I get involved in the dispensing of OTC devices that I'm you know, functioning within, within law. Um, now, uh, let's move past that and say, so uh, Starkey's last comment is about consumer protection, okay? So the concern here is that the proposed rule does not establish adequate federal consumer protections. And since much of the current regulation in the hearing aid industry is done on a state and local level, which will be preempted, and the federal level by the FDA, whose authority will be weakened by the FDA ceding restricted device authority, the question comes into play, who the heck is gonna protect the consumer here? Because I think this is probably the biggest concern that I have. Um, I am totally down for less regulation, but at some point, someone has to protect individuals who can't protect themselves. Um, and so this is kind of like my question in all of this. Um, but Starkey goes on to say that the FDA's authority to act against false or misleading advertisements only extends to restricted devices. And so if they give up this restricted device status, the FDA has no authority against false you know, claims and misleading advertisements, um, that would actually shift over to oversight by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, um, but we have no clarification as to what that ultimately means. So that would be nice to get some more clarification there. Um, so Starkey's proposed improvement for this is to establish a federal standard of consumer protection, mainly by preserving its restricted device authority, right? So they basically say, just, just don't give up the restricted device authority, keep it, because within this, the FDA can mandate warranties and returns, it can deter and punish false and misleading advertising claims about OTC hearing aids. Uh, the FDA could also expand labeling to explain that if someone is not receiving benefit from their OTC hearing aid, that they should seek out the care of a hearing care professional for programming and fitting assistance of that device or potentially a prescriptive level hearing aid if that individual in fact does not have a mild to moderate hearing loss, if they have something more complex than that. And so um, this is not outside of the realm of, of normal from a labeling standpoint to encourage someone who purchases a product to go and see a, a professional if they want help with it or explanation of it. Um, because uh, companies like 23andMe, which is the, the company that where you spit in that little vial, you send it off, you can get your DNA uh, analyzed and your ancestry and all of that stuff. Um, companies like that actually have to put language about seeing a genetic counselor or geneticist for post-test counseling and interpretation of genetic testing test results. Um, so I, I mean, I think that that's just a good idea overall to require that with OTC hearing aids as well. That's it for Starkey. That, those are all of Starkey's points. All right, so let's get into my thoughts about these comments submitted by Bose and Starkey. And what I have to say initially is that I agree with a lot of their comments and concerns about the proposed guidelines. Uh, but personally, I am a believer that less regulation is better. Besides, I mean, I feel like the FDA hasn't done a good job of regulating anything. Um, and I don't feel like if they even did come up with all of these consumer protections inside of this, that they would actually do anything to enforce it. So that's kind of the pessimist in me, even though I'm a really optimistic person typically. Um, 
However, I also do understand that there are some risks associated with over-the-counter hearing aids and that not all consumers are capable of protecting themselves from these unscrupulous uh, manufacturers that will pop up or that currently exist. I mean, there are thousands of individuals every single day that purchase these crappy online amplifiers thinking that they're legitimate hearing aids and they're not. And then they reach out and they complain, um, usually on my channel, about how crappy these products are and how they can't get a refund for them because the company is giving them the runaround. So, um, you know, we've got to protect consumers from those companies. And I just don't see that, that this is going to happen in any way. So I'm kind of upset by that. Now, as far as preemption goes, I've already kind of given you my thoughts here. I kind of echo the sentiment that we need more clarification so we can see how this impacts hearing care professionals as a whole. Um, you know, I, like I said, I want to get into the OTC space. I mean, I want to be able to kind of broaden accessibility and affordability of hearing aids and not just stay super narrow on extreme high quality care with extremely high quality devices. I think that, uh, individuals need choice when it comes down to it, but I want to be a conduit of that. I want individuals to be informed about these products. And then on top of that, be able to dispense these products to individuals who they are, are right for. Okay. Uh, now, my biggest fear here is the individual who ultimately tries an OTC hearing aid and it doesn't work for them and they end up uh, either like throwing it in their drawer but not seeking out professional care and just giving up on treatment. Uh, and there are very, very few hearing losses that cannot be helped. And in fact, you could make the argument that there is no such thing as a hearing loss that cannot be helped and helped substantially. So I just think that this risk of someone purchasing an OTC device thinking, ooh, okay, hearing aids are going to work for me and they're like, this doesn't work. See, no hearing aids work for me like that's what I want to try to avoid here and so I agree largely with Starkey's comments here that there has to be some kind of labeling here that says if you don't have success you really need to go see a hearing care professional for that and so um, you know Overall, what I guess I would say here is that uh, regardless of the direction that the FDA ultimately goes with their final guidelines that will come out here, who knows how long, is that um, you just need to make sure that you are an informed consumer because what, no matter what the FDA does, there's going to be these products that hit the market. Some are going to be good, some are going to be average, and some are going to be horrible. But you are going to have to figure out which ones are which. And I'm going to try to help you do that by doing reviews of any product that basically hits the market um, so you can get a better idea of which products are better than others. So in some way, shape, or form, the, the best way to combat getting ripped off by an uh, unscrupulous online hearing aid company is for you to do your due diligence and actually educate yourself and not rely on the federal or local government to do that for you. Okay, so hopefully this video has given you some kind of understanding of the comments that have come from all different directions to the FDA. Obviously, it's going to take them some time to kind of filter through this and see what ultimately makes sense to make it into the final rule or not. Because as of right now, we still do not know what an OTC hearing aid will be. But as soon as the final rule comes out, that is when we will know this is the exact criteria for an over-the-counter hearing aid. And then you can start getting excited because hearing aid manufacturers will be able to start um, developing products that meet all of those standards. So that is it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And as always, I'll see you next week.